Today again, well, let's pray and get stuck into Matthew's gospel, stuck into God's word. Lord God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the gospel of Matthew. Uh, and thank you for the way uh, that we're reminded of your grace on every page. Uh, Lord, and as we come to this account, this parable that Jesus tells today, uh, help us to contemplate your grace. Help us to understand your grace. Help us to get um, the truth of your grace deep into our hearts, that we may live in the light of your grace, the grace that you have shown us in Jesus. And Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in case you didn't pick up on <laughs> the prayer, uh, today is all about grace. Uh, it's a, a wonderful parable that Jesus tells, and it's tied into what we looked at um, last time. Uh, you might remember uh, when Jesus is talking to uh, the disciples after he had the conversation with the rich man, the rich man who asked the question, how do I, what good thing do I have to do to get eternal life? Um, and at the end of that little interaction with, with the disciples, uh, Jesus says, uh, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. And that's a kind of a perplexing thing to say. Uh, but this parable is what explains uh, Jesus' words. So let's read that. So this is chapter 20 now. Uh, words will be on the screen. Uh, chapter 20, starting at verse 1. Let's do that. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon, and about three in the afternoon did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, Why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, You also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those who came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first. And the first will be last. Well, what is Jesus saying? Uh, the big, big point um, of this parable that we should understand is God's grace. Okay, like we, we get bogged down sometimes in parables if we try to, you know, find a symbolic meaning for every little um, part of the parable, and actually that misses the point of parables. Parables often just have this main point that Jesus is trying to make. And of course, I think it's pretty clear in this parable because it's 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 bracketed by that, that, that phrase, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. So what is Jesus trying to explain to the disciples? Well, again, the parable, like most parables, is a description of the kingdom of heaven. And he talks about a landowner. Now, this landowner, of course, um, we should understand as God. And now he's got a, a, several uh, parts to, to uh, uh, in, uh, parts during the day where the landowner goes out and you know hires some workers into the vineyard, and they all agree to work for a denarius. But then you've got these these group of people who were still there at about five in the afternoon, so they had about an hour left. You know, a standard day ended at about six o'clock in the first century Jewish mindset, and so. They had about an hour left, and this landowner hired them. 
Um, and the day ends and the landowner, uh, you know, calls everyone to come and get um, their day's wages. And he pays them all the same. And of course, you know, the guys who were hired early, earlier in the day, they're like, what is going on? This is ridiculous. I mean, if this was 21st century Australia, the unions would be up in arms. Fair Work Commission would be called in. There'd be industrial relations lawyers. It'd appear on the six o'clock news, probably, or maybe a current affair expose. All right. But the point of this parable is not about industrial relations. It's about what God does for his people. Uh, and so what we should, should understand um, in the context in which Jesus is speaking this parable is you've got this group of people who came to work for the landowner earlier than this last group. And so what Jesus is really contrasting in this parable is the Old Testament people of God and the New Testament people of God. Or if you like, Israel and then the Gentile world. Okay? And... You know, the workers uh, were up in arms because they felt they should have got more. But God, or sorry, the landowner says in the parable, I'm not being unfair. You agreed to work for a denarius, take your pay, right? I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. And so what this parable is about is about how the Gentiles, the non-Jewish you know, the, the, uh, non people of the world, are about to be welcomed in to the kingdom of God. Right? And they're going to be welcomed in and given the same things as the people of Israel, even though the people of Israel have been the people of God for centuries. All right? In the parable, you know, don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Right? This is God's world. This is God's kingdom we're talking about. All right? why, should, why, why should Israel get up in arms? Because God decides to open the gates and welcome people from every nation. Uh, which was the intention all along anyway. I remember where this uh, gospel started with uh, the genealogy of, of Jesus, and it begins with Abraham. And of course, the key thing we should think about when we think about of Abraham is the promise of how a seed of Abraham, would uh, that God would bring blessing to the world through a child of Abraham. And that child through whom blessing would flow out to the world, of course, is Jesus. And so when that phrase comes in at the end again, you know, so the last will be first and the first will be last. Well, there seems to be a hint, um, and we can we can read this when uh, when uh, you get we get to the New Testament letters and you read Romans, for instance, and things like that. There seems to be a hint that from this point forward, the gospel will go out into the world, and people from every tribe and nation are going to to come to Christ in faith and come and join and be a part of God's kingdom. Uh, and so the last will be first. What of Israel? What of the promises that God made to them? Well, there's hints that there will be a time when Israel will start to come in and be a part of God's people once more in a big way. Uh, there are certain promises through Scripture that seem to hint, hint at that. And I think Jesus is hinting at that here. And so when he says the last will be first, he's talking about people like me, Gentile believers who have come into the kingdom. But at the last, at the end of all things, those who were first, the, the, the Old Testament people of God, well, they will come into the kingdom at the end. And that's not a given, of course, because the point of the parable is God's grace. Right? He gives everyone the same. All right? It's not about what you do. All right? You've got these workers who worked the whole day, and you've got these guys who worked the last hour, and they get the same thing. And so the reward, if you like, or the, 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 the landowner gives out, has nothing to do with how much they worked and has everything to do with how generous he is. As he says in the parable, why are you envious because I am generous? Right? It has to do with God's grace.
We're not saved by what we do. We are saved by God's grace to us in Jesus. And so whether we're Gentile believers or Jewish believers, we have to come to God through Christ. And together we form the new people of God. And so when we think about this passage and we think about God's grace in our life and how it should shape our lives, there's a number of things that we could uh, think about. But the first thing is we should celebrate it. Because God's grace is God doing for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Right? We didn't deserve his love. We didn't deserve his salvation. Yet he gave it to us anyway in Christ. He sent his one and only son into the world to live for us, to live that perfect, righteous, sinless life that we fail to live. And then Jesus dies the death we deserve to die for our sin. Jesus is our substitute. He becomes the sacrifice for our sin. So that all God's just wrath that should be poured out on us because of our sin is poured out on Jesus on the cross. And because God has punished our sin in, in Christ on the cross, we are, we are set free. When we trust in him, we are forgiven and set free and welcomed into the kingdom. We are welcomed into the loving arms of our Heavenly Father. It's all God's grace. So we should celebrate that grace every single day, reminding ourselves of it. And the next thing that we should do is we should let that grace shape our lives so that God's grace not only uh, is something that we receive in a sense, but something that flows through us out into the world. As we share that good news, as we seek to love one another the way that Christ has loved us. Um, and I, I want to say that there's one way in which uh, we sometimes seem to forget about God's grace in our life. Uh, and, and churches sometimes, uh, I think, are guilty of this, where we put up barriers for people and, and, and create a kind of situations where people have to be a certain way or look a certain way or do certain things before we will accept them as Christians. When the truth of the Bible, the truth of the scriptures is, no, the only thing that, that, that sets you apart uh, from someone who doesn't believe is when you believe, when you trust in Jesus. Right, Paul says in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you are saved. Right, we are saved by Jesus. We are saved by God's grace. And when we uh, you know, put these kind of extra things uh, upon people before we will accept them even into the church, um, when they've, you know, we, we, when, when they've... Um, talked about how they've come to faith or they've become Christians, but they don't, they don't dress the, the right way. Or maybe, I don't know, maybe they still smoke cigarettes or something like that, whatever. And we, and we, we have this uh, you know, picture of, of, of what a Christian should look like, perhaps because of our own church experience growing up or whatever it might be. But the point, uh, hopefully, we're getting as we fix our eyes on Jesus and through Matthew's gospel, that Jesus came to seek and save the lost. He came to call sinners to repentance. Right? And that's anyone and everyone. People from every tribe, every nation, every walk of life. Because we're saved by grace. We're not saved by the way we dress, by the job that we do. We're saved by Jesus. So we need to celebrate that and we need to let that truth shape our lives. So let's pray and give thanks for God's grace and ask for the Spirit to shape our lives by that same grace. Let's pray. Lord Almighty, we give you thanks and praise for Jesus, that you sent your one and only Son into this world, that whoever believes in him has that wonderful and glorious promise, they shall not perish, but they shall have eternal life. That is how much you love the world. That is how much you loved us. You sent your son to die for us. And that is your grace at work. 
doing for us what we cannot do for ourselves, Lord. And we thank you. We thank you for Jesus. We pray that you would help us um, to live for Jesus each and every day, to allow that grace to shape our lives, that we may be people of love and grace to others. And Lord, we pray this for your glory and in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I'll uh, hope you have a good weekend and keep fixing your eyes on Jesus.